so good morning. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you very much to, to you guys uh, at Space South Central for allowing us um, to talk about what we do and um, give a little bit of detail about Global Trust and yeah, space and satellites that, uh, that we use. So a bit about me. Um, my name is Jim Harvey. I'm the um, Business Engagement and Sustainability Manager at Global Trust. Uh, I've kind of got a background in business, uh, but also space sustainability, uh, working projects in the UK, um, specifically in Scotland, um, most recently um, spaceport sustainability, looking at the vertical spaceports being developed up at the top of Scotland. And with me I've got Ewan Bell, who's, uh, I'll let you introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm the other Ewan, Ewan too, um, and I'm part of the remote sensing earth observation team, um, some more technical background than uh, Ewan Harvey. There we go. Thank you. Um, so, Global Trust, um, who are we? Um, so we're a data analytics company um, that uses you know, the power of space technology and uh, space satellites to develop sustainable solutions. So we're based in uh, Winchester in the UK, uh, but we've also got investment from the Swedish Space Corporation, so we have an office over in um, Sweden. Um, we're a company of about two years, two and a half years, um, and about 15 employees. So I just want to talk about um, addressing the challenge. So the challenges that we face, that many of you I'm sure will be aware of, such as climate change, uh, resource depletion, um, rising consumption, and a kind of change in uh, society uh, behaviours. But speaking to, speaking to clients, speaking to the industry, um, there's often a lack of, or a feel for a lack of transparency or independent uh, in information around um, supply chains, around uh, operations, um, so we look at providing information and transparency and, and, and trust um, to kind of combat these core uh, aims of uh, preserving the environment, biodiversity um, and social evolution. So I'm going to hand you over to Ewan who's going to give a little story about uh, the evolution of, of satellite imagery. For those of you who are, who are aware of, of satellites and got a bit of knowledge, you may already know this, but those who maybe not, hopefully this is a nice little story to help demonstrate. So that's up to you. Uh, yeah, so as Ewan said, um, this section just talking about what we find, what we are really excited about currently in the Earth observation world, uh, and hopefully if you do know stuff about Earth observation, then you are equally excited uh, about these sort of things. So we've come a long way since the first um, open access data from Landsat in 1972, um, and for a long time the, the progression has been how can we get more detail visibly, how can the spatial resolution increase and you know right down to right now we have uh, sub, easily sub meter, um, 30 centimeter uh, data that's available commercially and it's really good you can show it to clients and you can very quickly you can see um, individual features on, on images uh, and very clear what's going on and along with these uh, the, the Landsat and other open access data a lot of academic use has come out of them, covering a whole range of different um, sectors and, and projects, and it's really great now that we can, we can do so many different things with satellite data. But as I was saying, as the race has been for, to, to try and push down for uh, greater spatial resolution, what's really exciting now is that we're having this, this uh, development into broadening the horizontal range, so uh, increase in uh, temporal resolution, so how quickly can we get satellite images over a site, uh, increases in spectral resolution, so how many uh, bands can we pick up, uh, and also increases um, with other types of data such as uh, radar data, SAR data, and LIDAR data. <clears throat> and what's also really great about this, uh, this time is that <coughs> as the decrease in cost of putting up satellites, uh, satellites for specific purposes are now being put up more and more and more. Whereas before we were talking about the open access, it's much more of a and the high quality, but they're much more of a broad range. Uh, talking about Sentinel-2 satellites from ESA or the Landsat previously, whereas now uh, we're seeing satellites for specific purposes. Uh, multiple satellites looking at ice, uh, JHG sat looking at methane, uh, and loads of other different topics which are now we can, we can focus on in, in much more in depth. And what else is really interesting is the, the decrease in satellite technology in terms of cost. Um, we're seeing many more emerging countries being able to put up their own satellites. So for instance, uh, last week uh, Kenya announced that they were going to be putting up their own satellites. So it's really interesting that it's a global opportunity for, for lots of different countries. And the really exciting thing now is <clears throat> 
that we can go to clients and we don't just have one or two different uh, satellites available to us. We can offer a broad range of options, whether that's through the open access data or whether that's through the commercial data, which uh, has explored it as well. And now we can offer clients really great analytical products to help them uh, so solve whatever issue they have. <clears throat> so going through an example that we did recently, this was for a for the mining site in the north of Sweden. They're moving the mining site um, in near Kiruna, and they wanted to know could they detect uh, different dust samples across their uh, area of interest. So on this image, you see that the um, darker colours are where we're getting less of a spectral match, going up to the red where there's more of a spectral match. So this is for one of the dust samples across the site. So at first we, we, we came to them with a, a range of different options. We have the, the Worldview 3, which is a, a sub I think a 30 centimeter resolution, very clear to clients that they can in, pick up individual uh, aspects such as cars or houses on the image. Um, but now we can offer them um, other satellite data which has a, a much broader spectral range. So going into the Sentinel 2 or the Prisma. And where we lose some of the, the detail, the spatial resolution, we actually increase the detail in differentiating different dust samples. Uh, and so this sort of, so when we're looking at the prisma, we actually get the, which has the uh, least detail in terms of visual seeing, we're actually getting the most differential between the different dust samples. Um, and then, so from this, we were able to give uh, high quality results to the client, we're able to to give them a, a, a much better understanding of where the different um, samples are found across the image. And so we feel a global trust that now we have the expertise to be able to offer this, this range of different um, options to clients so that they can, whether that be through commercial or open access, uh, to offer the best results going forward. I should like you to talk about some of the case studies. Juggle that across. Um, so yeah, now I just want to talk about some of the case studies, some of the you know, actual um, examples, put it, put it into life. Uh, so this was a, a case study from um, 2020, a few years ago now, uh, but looking at environmental monitoring. And this was a situation where the investment community came to us. Um, this is part of their uh, supply chain, part of their investment. And they came to us about this mine in um, northeast China. They'd, they'd heard that there was potential, there was rumours, there was um, kind of talkings that there's been a, a, a disaster, been a, you know, a, a breakdown in, in the mine. Um, that there were some issues, but they weren't speaking to the actual mine themselves. They were denying. They were saying there's nothing wrong, nothing happening here. So they asked us to kind of step in, um, and this is when we came and, and did an environmental assessment. And what we actually found was there was a failure in one of the one of the dams up here. I'm not sure you can see it too well, but there was a break in one of these dams. And what this meant that there was actually seepage and actually hazardous waste flooding down into local um, water sources and um, local rivers affecting the population. And that allowed us, and that allowed the investment community to actually have some raw data there, actually have data in front of them to make a decision, to actually say, look, there's, you know, there is a problem here, and have that evidence to say, actually, you know, we're going to divest, we're going to continue to invest. So it's, again, that kind of putting that information and having that transparency there. So another example is looking at critical minerals. Um, we don't push on. Uh, critical minerals, which we all know are a real quite vital part of everyday life. Um, look at you know your um, set of iPhone um, mobile devices um, to the push for net zero and um, electric cars. But as much as you know electric cars, we're saying you know the great look for the environment. But we want to make sure that these finite resources that we are mining are actually. You know, we're actually helping the planet by doing this and, and extracting them the best way um, as we can. Um, so using space technologies, um, we could provide environmental insights, looking at the effects of these mines on pollution, on, on water here, it's a water quality diagram, to make sure that you know, as a society we are actually trying to you know, help the environment rather than doing more harm. So emissions, um, we can monitor emissions from space. Um, again, you know, exciting. Um, from regional um, applications, look at methane concentrations here, um, to sorry, methane concentrations here, to more local dust around factories monitoring um, um, construction sites around big um, 
construction areas. So it's a possible, so it allows mitigation measures, uh, uh, measures putting warnings in place of, you know, if there is certain areas which are having a, a social, uh, negative social impact. And it allows that supplier due diligence, again going back through the supply chain of you know, a larger company, to actually see what the environmental and social effects are uh, throughout the supply chain. So kind of touched on this, but operational monitoring. So identifying changes in the maturity uh, of supply chain, looking at that activity level monitoring from uh, asset estimations, looking at stockpiles, um, looking at counter containers, looking at um, solar energy, you know, where, where are these locations, um, locations based. So it allows that kind of um, whole uh, holistic view uh, from, a, from a company to actually put real data uh, in place on tracking. So just a few uh, closing remarks. Um, hopefully today we've discussed you know, the importance of, of space data and how, how exciting um, it is part of everyday, uh, everyday use. I think for corporates, it's, we're seeing a need um, from them that they're facing more challenges around reporting. Um, you'll see a lot of the uh, new frameworks and policies, um, along with you know, SDGs and TCFDs, of actual needing information to put into these reports. So space data can have a big role in um, supplying that independent and you know, transparent and save someone jetting off across the world and actually spending weeks looking at, you know, uh, is this water flowing into local villages? You know, we can see all this uh, from space. So it's great to see a real environmental focus, especially um, in the sector. I look forward to, you know, this exciting journey um, as, you know, space really looks into um, uh, migrating into further sectors. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ian. Any questions, please do get into contact with us. Uh, our email is here. Have a good for a chat.